right, everybody, welcome back. If you could take your seats. Now I introduce myself as moderator Jill, not speaker Jill. So hello again, everybody. Um, we are going to have now a well, first, let me say a couple of things. I'm so excited about all the speakers. So uh, when, when I was talking about coming to do this and I saw the program, I was so excited because like some of my heroes are talking and literally every single topic is something that I have a personal interest. So I'm going to have to make sure that I don't just get engrossed and forget that I'm moderating the conference. is going to be my challenge. Um, and the the... What we're going to do now is we're going to have Mark come and present about Formula One. I'll do a bit of an intro in a second. And then I'm going to do a Q&A up here. And then we're going to have a reflection session. And then there'll be lunch. So just to signpost you to what's happening next. Um, I don't know about you, but during lockdown, I did a lot of watching Netflix. And one of the things that I watched was the Formula One Netflix series. And I, I'm super, I'm not really into Formula One as a sport, but I'm passionate about the high performance. So I thought, oh, well, I've got nothing else to do. Let me watch this Netflix series. And I got absolutely engrossed in this. So we're really, really lucky to have Mark joining us again. So Mark Gallagher. And Mark is a former Formula One executive and today runs Performance Insights. Um, his management career in Formula One included more than a decade on the management board of the highly successful race-winning Jordan Grand Prix team, running the world-famous Cosworth engine business and establishing the commercial arm of Red Bull Racing, which went on to become four times world champion. So I am, without further ado, going to hand you over to Mark, who's going to talk about sustaining safety, Formula One's relentless quest to eliminate fatal accidents. So over to you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed. Uh, and good morning, uh, everyone. Great to have this opportunity to come back here to Esbjerg and uh, share a few more thoughts from the world of Formula One. Can I ask for a show of hands? Who was here in 2014 when I presented? Oh, wow. OK. Got my, that's, that's my brother. Um, uh, OK, actually, not as many as I thought. So most of, you are, most of you are new. But actually, for the benefit of those who were here in 2014, it's not going to be a repeat showing. Um, so this is very much chapter two because, uh, and really what I want to do uh, to start the presentation is just to go through a, a little bit of a summary of how we got here and to emphasize that when I stand here talking about how we manage risk and ensure safety in the sport of Formula One, it feels almost frivolous to be doing that just a few moments after we heard such a powerful presentation uh, about the Grenfell disaster, in which 72 people who were not supposed to be taking risk, sitting in their own homes, lose their lives. Whereas in the case of Formula One, we're dealing with rather well-paid Formula One drivers who accept that what they do is it has an inherent amount of risk attached to it. That's not to say that they go into every race expecting to have a catastrophic outcome, far from it. And what I presented in 2014 was really the 25-year journey that Formula One had been on in terms of safety and in safety transformation. Uh, moving from a sport which had seen 40, over 40 driver fatalities in 45 years, so we pretty well had one a year from 1950 through to 1994. Actually, some years we had two or three, some years we had no fatalities, to a sport which in 2014, I was able to come to this conference and really present quite a good success story because we had had 20 years where we had not had a single further driver fatality. So over 40 fatalities in 45 years, and then a 20-year hiatus. And we've all sat in those meetings. Last night, we were talking at dinner about, uh, you know, when you go to a management meeting and people have KPIs and, you know, everyone's pat patting each other on the back saying, look, at those figures are, are terrific. Well, it was very much had become like that in Formula One. Our safety record had become really exemplary. But at the end of my 2014 presentation, I did say that our biggest enemy was complacency. 
and that the further we get from one major incident, we have to believe the closer we get to the next one because the risks fundamentally do not dis disappear. They do not go away. And in the case of Formula One, we're dealing with managing risk, and the risk fundamentally hasn't changed. It's how we deal with it. It's how we ensure that the outcomes mean that no one is going to be injured, certainly that no one is going to lose their life, that everyone goes home to their family at the end of the day. And one very small footnote to that introductory comment is that when I talked about the 40-plus driver fatalities that we had had between 1950 and 1994, those also sometimes involved other stakeholders, including members of the public, who were killed in the accidents that took place at, at Formula One sporting events. So this wasn't just about the driver community, it was about lots of other stakeholders uh, present at events. So Formula One is very much about managing risk. And safety is at the center of how we conduct our operations. It's at the center of the technologies that we deploy when we create the machines that we race. And I have to say, I thought the NASA um, reenactment this morning was so powerful and so sad that Alan McDonald has not been able to join us uh, here, you know, having passed away in the springtime, to talk about that very powerful case study because when there was just that moment, wasn't there, where the Morton Thiokol manager said, you know, said to the engineer, take off your engineering hat and put on your management hat. Well, in Formula One, we run technology companies, we run engineering businesses. And what we have to do in management in Formula One is to take off our management hat and put on our engineering hat. When it comes to, make, comes to making the right decisions about how we spend money, around safety and risk management and ensuring that that is the one business outcome that we need to absolutely ensure is handled correctly. Um, I'm going to start my presentation with this uh, photograph behind me because this year in 2021, risk and the effective management of risk and ensuring safety is again at the absolute forefront of my sport because here you have a photograph of the two chief protagonists in Formula One this year. Lewis Hamilton, seven times world champion, 36 years of age, driving for Mercedes-Benz, racing against Max Verstappen, 23-year-old Dutchman, uh, looking for his first world championship title, very much towards the beginning of his career uh, in Formula One, and it's a very thrilling contest. But in two of the most recent four Formula One events, they have been involved in really quite serious accidents with each other, serious collisions. And so I come here today um, with the world championship leader, Max Verstappen, having just received two points on his license. Yes, we have, we have points on driver's licenses in Formula One too. Um, and points on your license is a bad thing because that can ultimately lead to him being banned from participation in the sport. And at the next Formula One race, he has a three grid penalty because of his actions on Sunday in the most recent Formula One race in Italy. So actually the big topic in my industry at the moment is about decisions that are being made by key protagonists and whether those decisions are being supported or not by their management in relation to safety and risk. And when you look at what happened on Sunday, which is um, Lewis Hamilton coming out of the pits and Max Verstappen coming down the outside of them, and they go into the first chicane together, and they collide. And Max's car goes on top of Lewis Hamilton's Mercedes-Benz. And uh, I'll see if I can replay that. I did promise the AV guys I wouldn't give them too many headaches, but uh, that's quite a short clip. And if you watch that clip, so you have the two chief protagonists coming into that first corner and colliding, and Max Verstappen's Red Bull going on top of Lewis Hamilton's Mercedes-Benz. It's actually quite a low-speed impact. But one thing we've learned, long since learned in Formula One is that risk comes in all shapes and sizes, and you can be killed or injured at a very low speed just as much as in a very high-speed incident. And actually, when we take a stills photograph from this incident, you actually discover that Max Verstappen's, the rear wheel of his car, which is transmitting 1,000 brake horsepower, is on Lewis Hamilton's head. And if this accident had happened five years ago, 
I think Lewis Hamilton might not be with us today. And it is a really interesting fact that one of the, and I was talking this morning about this, that one of the reasons we spend so much time, effort, and money in Formula One on safety technology, on improving safety procedures, on training, and yes, on an empirical approach, every time something happens, we do something about it. One of the reasons we do that is it drives the safety culture. You cannot work in Formula One and be ignorant of the fact that safety is central to how we operate. So when something like this happens, it immediately triggers a response across everyone in the industry into recognizing that this could so easily have had very serious consequences. Now, as it happened, Lewis Hamilton was being protected by a piece of equipment that was only introduced in 2017, 20, uh, 2018, which is the halo. And as a result of the halo, uh, his helmet only suffered actually an abrasion to the surface of the helmet. But if you want to know what that, that sort of black and green mark is, that's the rubber of the tire of Max Verstappen's Red Bull Honda. So pretty dramatic stuff. And risk is at the center of our approach. Risk management is at the center of our approach to all aspects of what we do in Formula One engineering companies. Um, it's great to have the opportunity to talk in front of a live audience, as Jill said uh, earlier on. If I could kidnap uh, you all and take you to Red Bull Racing, uh, I could show you around an engineering facility in terms of what we actually do Monday to Friday in a Formula One team. We design and manufacture lots of technologies from aerospace, automotive, and information technology, which we then integrate into creating the product which we then take to market. Now, our product happens to be a Formula One car, but it's essentially a big piece of complex engineering into which we place a human being as the machine operator to go out and do their job. That's the nature of what we do. And as I said in 2014, it took a seismic event to shift our approach to safety. And it is really quite, now I have a lot of thoughts about what it is that really drives change in businesses, in society, in industries. Um, although I'm from Ireland, I live, I've lived in the UK all of my professional career, and you know, to watch Jill's presentation, I know that, um, that block. Um, I, I drive past it, I used to live in Ealing. Um, and of course, to live in the UK, we've seen the drip, drip, drip of the Grenfell Inquiry and the shocking findings that have come out from that. And there's no question that that is leading to change and really profound change for the construction industry, for planning, for local government, and for millions of people who at the moment are unable to sell or mortgage their properties because of the cladding uh, issue. So Grenfell is a truly seismic catastrophe that's having a massive impact on the whole of uh, the UK and lots of sectors within it. In the case of Formula One, our big moment, as I shared in 2014, was the death of Ayrton Senna. And there's something interesting in terms of a similarity between the death of a Formula One world champion in, an, in the Italian, in the Grand Prix in Italy in 1994 and the Grenfell disaster. It was broadcast live on television. And that has a really powerful effect on all the stakeholders. And, and I say that because actually the flip side of it is that when Formula One was not being broadcast live on television in the 1950s and 1960s and 1970s, the deaths were reported the day after on the back page of a newspaper, maybe sometimes on the front page. But we now live in a world where instant news is upon us, and every single person with a cell phone is a, is a media broadcaster. Anyone can broadcast live, real time. And your disasters will be instantly out there. So the days of it being hidden are gone, and Formula One learned that lesson in a really profound way in 2014. And the television images in 1994 were completely live. And since then, we have, 
we don't broadcast Formula One live. If, if you're paying a live subscription to any companies, you're being slightly cheated by about five seconds um, because we now have a delay to enable the director to cut away from any images that we don't want to be broadcast live uh, around the world. But Ayrton Senna's death was live on television. And that became the defining moment for us. And our regulator, the FIA, under the president, Max Mosley, Formula One is a company under Bernie Eccleston, chief executive, and all the constituent teams and all of the circuits came together after that moment and agreed on change. And it led to a, a shift in every aspect of our operations. You know, one of the reasons I love coming to this conference is, you know, task force zero, the race to zero. We want zero fatalities. We want serious injuries. We want serious life-changing circumstances. Zero is our target. And that target was mandated by the president of the FIA two weeks after the Ayrton Senna uh, accident. He said, we have to have zero repeat. The changes which resulted involved every aspect of our operations. The environment within which we operate, so every Formula One track in the world was redesigned. And actually some of those redesigns were instant because a team of people was put together after the Ayrton Senna fatality and within, within two weeks they had put together a list of dangerous corners on individual circuits in the world and those circuit promoters were told that they had to change the designs immediately to mitigate the, the, the likelihood of any further impacts of that nature. But as a result, since then, and we're now talking 27 years ago, every Formula One track in the world is now designed and built to a template in terms of the trajectory, the likely trajectory of vehicles in an accident, their impact point, the structure they impact with, the speed with which a driver can be attended to and rescued. Every, every aspect has been analyzed, and the risk analysis in Formula One has enabled us to come up with a template, which means that whether we're racing in Russia, or Brazil, or China, or France, or Italy, we are operating to the same levels of safety. And as I said um, previously, the our objective is that no Formula One team should be better at safety than any other Formula One team. We, want, we, don't, want ocean, we don't want islands of excellence and oceans of mediocrity. We want everyone to operate at the same standard. And the fact that the regulator and the teams and the commercial rights holders came together to have a unified approach. Regulator's not the bad guy. We're all on the same page. We want the whole industry to be as safe as possible. We don't want people to watch drivers being killed live on television. We don't want drivers to be injured. We don't want spectators to be injured. So that template for circuit design was an immediate outcome, and it has been revised and revised and improved year in, year out since. Centralizing communications. Having a centralized communications uh, platform and system at every single Formula One event where the race director literally has all of the information in front of him, supported by his team with real-time data, real-time video, real-time audio communications, so that the race director can call a halt to operations. Call a halt to operations. And what an important topic that is. And again, I'm standing here today with you, just a few weeks after we called a halt to operations. Any of you who had the misfortune of trying to watch the Belgian Grand Prix on television a month ago will know that the race didn't happen. We, we halted operations. And it's really interesting, again, over dinner last night, I was talking to people about what happens when you call a halt to operations. You would think, wouldn't you, that the fans around the world would be so glad that Formula One looked after the safety and welfare of the drivers. 
Social media exploded. Now, I, had fans, I had fans messaging me saying, you guys have lost your courage. You know, what about the good old days? You know, good old days of death. Good old days of life-changing injuries. Good old, change, old, good old days of fire and flames and disaster. There was nothing good about it. We have moved on. And when Michael Massey, the race director in Formula One, made the decision at the Belgian Grand Prix to halt operations, he had complete authority and was fully empowered by all of the key stakeholders, by the regulator, by the commercial rights holder, by all the teams, 100% support. Tough decision. And I'm going to talk about that uh, a little bit more in a few moments. So that's his office. And from, her, from there, he has the big picture of what's happening. And he can ultimately decide whether we're safe or not to continue. The introduction of the safety car and the high-speed medical intervention cars to mitigate risks in the event of an, an accident. So the drivers are being attended to quickly. Um, I told this story in 2014, and for those of you who were there, I will um, apologize as I, I think I, I told this anecdote. But the idea of the high-speed uh, medical intervention car was uh, the creation of one of the champions of safety in Formula One, a guy called Professor Sid Watkins. Now, Sid Watkins was a neurosurgeon at uh, uh, Royal London Hospital, and in 1978, uh, Bernie Eccleston, who was chief executive of Formula One, asked Sid if he would come and start to look at improving safety and medical facilities and basically move Formula One into a new era. And sometime later, the idea was suggested to Bernie Eccleston by Sid. Um, it wasn't actually Sid's idea, it was someone else's idea, but they brought it to Sid and he thought it was a great one, which is that when we start a Formula One race, there would be a medical intervention vehicle follow the cars on lap one. Because statistically, when you look at the data, the most likely accident is going to occur on the first lap. When 20 young men, they're still men, we're trying to find women to race in Formula One, anyone wants to do it, we're dead keen. Um, 20 young men without a great deal of imagination driving Formula One cars on lap one, they quite often run out of talent. Okay, So we do get accidents at that part of the, the race. And the suggestion was made to have a high-speed intervention vehicle follow the field, and in the event of an accident, the car can arrive on like within seconds and attend to the driver uh, or drivers if they've had an incident. Now, when Sid took this idea to Bernie Eccleston, Bernie thought it was terrible. He said, this is going to look awful on television. We're going to have a Formula One race with these 20 courageous Formula One drivers and these beautiful cars, and you're basically suggesting we have an ambulance at the back following the field. And Sid said, well, you know, you won't see it. It'll be so far at the back, and it's obviously quite slow. But he said, I'll demonstrate it for you. So they, de they demonstrated it at the Brazilian Grand Prix uh, in a round of the Brazilian Touring Car Championship. So they had all these Brazilian touring cars on the grid. Sid was in the back in his medical intervention car, driven by Emerson Fittipaldi, three times Formula One world champion. And the idea was that Emerson would follow the field on the first lap and then come into the pits. Now, Sid, Sid swears that he briefed Emerson correctly what he was supposed to do, simply follow the field on the first lap. And Sid told me, um, he said, I knew things had gone wrong when at the end of lap one, we passed the pits and we were in 12th position. <laughs> With me in the passenger seat, a paramedic in the back, and an anaesthetist and a bunch of medical equipment. Um, so that didn't really go according to plan. But Bernie got the idea, and since then we've had these high-speed medical intervention vehicles and safety cars. And then finally, the point I made earlier about the need to... We're constantly revising the safety technology. So it's about environment, it's about communications, it's about systems, it's about technology. And that hands device, that head and neck safety system, uh, which was introduced 20 years, over 20 years ago, has just saved countless lives not just in Formula One, but across all world motorsport. In the United States, they were very reluctant to introduce that because they felt it kind of diminished the driver's look, you know, like it was a bit less 
a bit less cool if you put a helmet and a safety thing on, like it was too much. Uh, they changed their opinion when one of their legendary drivers, Dale Earnhardt, was killed as a result of a, a neck injury in a NASCAR race. And literally overnight, the Americans adopted exactly the same system. Costs about 800, 600, 800 euros. You can get slightly cheaper ones. It's not an expensive piece of equipment, but it was developed by a biomechanical, biomechanical engineer, and the results are astonishing. So there are lots of areas that we have revised our approach, which has driven that safety transformation. But in terms of tools, there is no question that the fact that we work in an environment of real-time data means that we can drive uh, urgency into mitigating risk. And there's no doubt that our digital transformation journey has played a really significant role in helping us to have the real-time information, including at re remote operations, which means that we can call a halt to operations. It means that we can advise the driver or make adjustments or do whatever we need to do to ensure that we don't get those negative outcomes. Um, quality. Safety is a quality outcome. We want quality of outcomes. So when we have a conversation about safety from an engineering point of view in Formula One, we, we almost in inevitably end up having a conversation about the robustness and the reliability of our systems. You know, and again, when I, I you know, watch the Morton Thiokol reenactment, you know, engineering integrity systems, people being able to stand over what they've done and say, yeah, that's absolutely fit for purpose. It will do the job, no question. The engineering is proven. And our digital transformation environment in Formula One is such that our teams sitting in their headquarters, Red Bull and Milton Keynes in uh, just about one hour north of London, Mercedes-Benz Formula One team in Brackley, which is uh, about 20 minutes north of Oxford, Ferrari and Maranello in Italy, we run the races remotely. All the key strategy decisions are made remotely because we have all the real-time data, we have all the real-time video, we have all the real-time audio, we have the big picture, and we can call a halt to operations. And we call a halt to operations all the time when we see tre through trend analysis and through real-time analytics, we can see that we're about to suffer a failure. Now, most of the time, it means we're about to suffer a failure that means the car is simply going to, going to break down, it's going to not finish the race. But sometimes we can see failure modes developing, which can, will, could potentially lead to a catastrophic outcome. And when you're, when you're driving in a Formula One car at 360 kilometers an hour, which was the speeds they were doing on Sunday in, in uh, Monza, you really don't need the car in front of you suffering an engine failure and exploding in your face. So as a result, when we start to see engi engines go into those failure modes, we can shut down operations, tell the driver to stop. We avoid those outcomes. As a result of that focus on quality systems and quality management from an engineering point of view, we have, it has played a key role in our safety journey. And if you take someone like Lewis Hamilton, people often say to me, yeah, Formula One's so boring, he's won seven world championship titles, etc." Actually, one of the reasons he's been so successful is because of the robustness and the resilience of the engineering systems. He has suffered one one technical failure during a Grand Prix in five years, which was a drop in hydraulic pressure at the Austrian Grand Prix about three years. That was, that's it. I don't know about you, I haven't had a road car that's been that good for five years. He's driving a Formula One car. So there, there is a kind of one metric around what's happened as a result of us taking that approach, that data-driven approach to managing our risk real time and ensuring that when we have a view of the future, we can predict the outcomes with incredible accuracy and avoid those catastrophic turns of events. Now, I make no apologies for the fact that in 2014, I showed the old Swiss cheese model. Um, and I talked about the fact that this is our big fear where you have a day where everything lines up in the wrong way, 
where despite the compliance, despite safety being at the center of all of our engineering and all of our operations, despite the systems and processes that had ensured great safety and security for 20 years, despite all that technology that we have and the brilliant people, that you get a series of decisions and a series of events that line up and leads to a loss. And so it was very much just a few months after I was last here that we then lost another driver, Jules Bianchi. And in the 2014 Japanese Grand Prix, 5th of October 2014, um, another competitor went off the track. The conditions were very difficult. Weather played a key role in this incident. Uh, the conditions were difficult. Another competitor, Adrian Sutil, went off the track. And the procedure when someone goes off the track and crashes, uh, is, he didn't have a major accident, he just went off the track, um, is that you, you wave double yellow flags at that, that area of the track. So that segment of the track becomes subject to double yellow flags. And that enables the marshals to recover the car safely. And in this occasion, they sent a, a crane, a six-wheeled crane, to the scene of the accident to, to lift the car uh, over the barrier. Now, double yellow flags are a very clear rule. Every Formula One driver, every racing driver knows what that means. Double yellow uh, wave flag means that there's an incident. You have to slow down and prepare to stop. Slow down and prepare to stop. Now, to you or me, slowing down, preparing to stop probably means, you know, 20 or 30 kilometers per hour. For Formula One drivers, slowing down, preparing to stop means going from 300 kilometers down to 200. Uh, and they've been pushing that envelope uh, over the years. How far do you slow down? Now, there are penalties if you don't slow, slow down enough. And for reasons of competitive instinct, not wanting to slow down enough, we will never know. Jules Bianchi sadly did not slow down sufficiently and when he arrived at the scene of the previous accident, he lost control on the same pool of water which had caused the first car to aquaplane off the track, and he speared off uh, the circuit. But instead of hitting the Armco barrier, for which the car is designed, or instead of hitting the other car, for which we also design our cars, he hit the crane and submarined underneath it, and suffered what would become a fatal injury, fa fatal head injury. And just to put a little bit of data around the, that incident, he lost control at 212 kilometers per hour. He hit the crane at 121 kilometers per hour. The impact with the crane was 92 g-force. There was a peak G-force of 254 G. It was not survivable. Under any circumstances, it was not survivable. Um, he could not be airlifted to hospital because the weather was so bad that the air ambulance was unable to fly. As a result, he was transferred the 15 kilometers to hospital by road. He never recovered from the coma that he went into, and he passed away at close to his home in Nice in France the following uh, July. And the findings of the uh, inquiry into the Bianchi accident were issued two months after the accident. Very rapid response to what, for our industry, was a stark reminder that those tw that 20 year hiatus was nothing to be that proud about because it had come to a crashing end with the loss of a valued young colleague. The track was drying, but due to poor drainage on the track, there was a river of water running across it at that point. So drainage on the track was a, a, a significant issue. The double yellow flag signals were in place. 
and every driver should have slowed down and prepared to stop, but the car speed was not reduced sufficiently, so that there was human act actions involved, unfortunately on Jules' part. That, this was followed by a loss of control, and that then led to uh, a really significant development. I mentioned the digital transformation has played such a key role in Formula One safety journey. And yet one of the factors that led to Jules suffering uh, a fatal injury is that in the 2.6 seconds he had between losing control and impacting with the crane, he tried to brake, he jumped on the brakes, but he unfortunately also jumped on the accelerator. So both the accelerator and the brake were deployed at the same time. Now, there is a fail-safe algorithm within the electronic management system that means basically when, the, when those two signals arrive, the computer knows to shut off the throttle. However, on Jules's car, that algorithm was overridden by a torque sensor on the rear um, on the rear of the car. So the car continued to drive torque, maximum torque. Torque was being, power was being demanded, so power was being provided. And that's one of the reasons why the impact uh, speed was so high. So that was a failure of fly-by-wire digital technologies. Velocity of the car and impact, and then the presence of the recovery crane. I think one of the really interesting points to observe around this accident, we can talk about it perhaps a little bit more in the discussion, was that a whole new generation of employees within the industry suddenly experienced a fatality for the first time. You know, older guys like me, we have seen it all before, but in 2014 we had drivers, engineers, mechanics, people at every level in every team who thought this was ancient history. They thought this was something that happened. This happened last century. This doesn't happen in the 21st century. So it drove a really urgent response. Implementation of the virtual safety car. So those double yellow flags that I talked about, we have realized we can't rely on those because the drivers take, first of all, the drivers take too long to, to respond and they make judgments about how much they should slow down. And that's not good enough. And also, it can sometimes take the race director several minutes to decide to deploy the safety car. The safety car is often deployed to slow the race down. And of course, it sometimes can take half a minute or a minute for the safety car to deploy itself in the correct manner. So one month after Jules Bianchi's accident, Formula One tested a virtual safety car, which is the moment the race director sees an incident which causes concern, he can literally press a button, and the whole way around the track, you have a virtual safety car signal. And as soon as the safe, virtual safety car signal is seen at the track side and on the dashboard of every Formula One car, the drivers have to slow down to a certain delta, and if they breach that, they will be penalized. So effectively, they have to drop their speed by at least 35%. And that's instantaneous. So we've removed the delay that used to take place. There was a major review of software compatibility. You can't have different systems that don't talk to each other, one overriding the other system. There was a, one of the significant findings. The revised guidelines in terms of track drainage, then deployed around the world. Total event duration time has, was completely changed immediately after that uh, accident. So the Japanese Grand Prix on that day started at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Dusk was at 17.58. So we had a two hour, 58 minute window before dusk. But the problem was there was a typhoon in the area. It was dark, there had been torrential rain, we were getting towards dusk. And there was lots of delay in terms of the race events. We now operate to a three-hour window. If we cannot hold the Formula One event within a three-hour window, we cancel operations. It's not going to, we end operations. So prior to 2014, it was open-ended. That's no longer the case. 
every driver who is awarded a super license based on their skill and experience now has to go through more training in terms of their response and responsibility in relation to managing safety and having the correct behaviors. And then there was a full, full uh, analysis of all Formula One event operations. So that's been the focus of the last seven years. And every aspect has been revised. Suppliers, contractors like Pirelli, who provide our wet weather tires, heavily engaged in making sure that the correct technologies are deployed at the right time, that they've been fully tested in the relevant conditions, and that we get no surprises. Furthermore, we have taken the step of taking our crash testing. So we crash test Formula One uh, cars, of course, in terms of front, rear, side, and rollover impacts. But we decided to extend that further because we had already been looking at cockpit safety. How do you prevent something coming into the driver's cockpit? You know, they're sitting there with their helmet, but you could be hit by a piece of debris, you could be hit by a wheel. And actually, we've been testing this since uh, the first decade of the century, just running trials and tests to see what kind of structures could be put in front of the driver to prevent, protect them from a large piece of debris coming into the cockpit area. And this led to a couple of different designs being evolved, the one on the left being the halo device, the one on the right being the aero screen. And there's a really important point to note about the, this photograph, which is that here you have Ferrari and Red Bull actively engaged with the regulator in testing and, develop and safe, testing and developing safety equipment prior to it being sanctioned for deployment. So the research and de development laboratory for safety in Formula One is all stakeholders. Any Formula One team can be asked by the FIA to contribute, to help, to support, and everyone buys into that because we need real-world solutions that are going to actually have uh, a positive effect on safety outcomes. And as a result of those tests, it was finally decided in 2017 that the halo would be deployed. It's made from titanium, weighs nine kilograms, it sits on top of the car, it looks disgusting, uh, all the fans complained, all the media complained, everyone complained, some of the drivers complained, everyone complained, until in 2018, Fernando Alonso's car went over the top of Charles Leclerc's Sauber at the Belgian Grand Prix, and we discovered that the halo had saved his life. And Charles Leclerc is the godson of Jules Bianchi, who lost his life in 2014. So the proof of that change was almost instantaneous. Suddenly, all the negative comments about the halo just melted away. And now, everyone agrees it has positively saved a number of lives to the extent that I can, I can, I think, hand on heart say we probably avoided three other fatalities since I last spoke here. That's a major outcome. In November last year, uh, rolling news media around the world uh, showed Roman Grosjean's accident at the Bahrain Grand Prix. Uh, it happened on the first lap of the race at turn three. His car speared off the track and hit the barrier. It was a 67 G-force uh, impact. Uh, the car penetrated the barrier, uh, broke in two, and the Kevlar fuel tank was ruptured. Actually, at an inspection hatch was ruptured and one of the fuel lines was ruptured. We don't normally get fuel fires in Formula One because we have self-sealing systems, but such was the ferocity of this accident. The system was, uh, was ruptured. It made for spectacular viewing on television. Keep your eyes on the, on the bottom of the, the screen towards the back of the field. Uh, the two cars collide. Uh, Roman uh, hits the barrier at an angle of uh, 29 degrees, and you can see the car split in two. And the images were truly spectacular to watch on television. Um, I, I decided not to show any of the photography or, stills or, or videos of the Bianchi, 
accident. But I'm happy to show this because of the outcome. You see the Mercedes-Benz car, which is the high-speed medical intervention vehicle I talked about. That car was driven by professional racing driver Alan van der Merwe, who's it's his permanent job in Formula One. In the passenger seat was Dr. Ian Roberts, who's a trauma specialist. The car arrived on scene 11 seconds after Roman hit the barrier. 11 seconds. The driver, Alan van der Merwe, had realized that there was no accident at turn one, and he knew a shortcut. So he took a shortcut, which meant that he arrived at turn three 11 seconds after the accident took place. Dr. Ian Roberts jumped out of the passenger seat and was greeted by a fire marshal, a local Bahraini fire marshal, who had arrived on the scene with a fire extinguisher. And Dr. Ian Roberts immediately realized that the driver was trying to egress from the car and therefore directed the marshal and the fire extinguisher to dampen the flames to in order to help Romain Grosjean to exit the car. Every Formula One driver has to be able to exit the car in five seconds. You train for it and you are tested for it. And as a result, it's muscle memory. Drivers know exactly what they need to do to undo their harness, take the steering wheel off and get out of the car. What made life a little bit more difficult for Roman was everything was on fire, including him and the armco barrier was on top of the cockpit, which meant he couldn't get out the normal way. He had to try a couple of different angles. And you see in the, the, the middle of the flames, he's still in the cockpit. Uh, Dr. Roberts and the fire marshal director direct the fire extinguishant, and Roman uh, emerges uh, pretty well uninjured. He did have, a, he did have a, a burn to the back of his hand, and it did require some uh, skin grafting. But for us, this looks to the outside world like a catastrophe, but actually every single thing here did its job. The halo did its job. The helmet did its job. The, the safety cell did its job. The fireproof clothing did their job. The driver's training did their job. The medical intervention car did their job. When you look at the animation of what happened, and how the car impacted on the, the nose of the car matched perfectly with the middle of the three-tier barrier, and it peeled the middle of the three-tier barrier back like opening a can. It literally got straight into that cap, that gap. And as I say, the car is doing quite a speed, over 200 kilometers per hour. And then the car rotates through the barrier, and you see how the halo actually protected Roman's head as it goes through the barrier, and the stanchion, which holds the barrier up, that vertical stanchion was driven into the ground. That broke the car in two, which is why the rear section of the car broke away. And in the rear section of the car, pulling away with all of its ancillaries have, uh, being, being split, you then see the fire erupt from the inspection hatch on the safety cell um, and that ruptured uh, fuel line, so you get the conflagration that occurs, would absolutely have been a fatality if we did not have the halo. No question about it. But instead, we, you, we get the outcome we all want to have. Roman goes home to his family. And that's so fantastic to see him post that on Twitter a, couple, a few weeks later with his wife, Marion. You know, they've got young children. They're in the prime of their life. And there is, that's the outcome of our safety journey, is he's alive and well and able to continue his career with his family. And if you are ever bored with traveling now in the, as we head towards post-COVID, on the official Formula One podcast, very easy to find, official Formula One podcast, there is an interview with Roman about the accident. And his description of his 27 seconds on fire, I think takes about 15 minutes. And what went through his mind and his training.
There is a second podcast with Dr. Ian Roberts and Alan van der Merwe, the driver of the safety car, and they talk about the build-up for them to be able to ensure that that rescue took place in the way that it did. So my final comments are, there, is, there are two courageous people. A wife who has the courage to cope with her husband who does a high risk job as a Formula One driver. A courageous Formula One driver. But then think about the courage that we all need to have. The courage of leadership to say that we will call a halt to operations. We will invest the time, the money, and the energy into making sure that that is the outcome. The courage to speak out. The courage to say to the management, put on your engineering hat before we make a final decision. And the courage of our convictions as safety professionals to ensure that we drive the outcomes that we can be proud of. Thank you very much.